1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we saw it and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing this that our joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. I have a bad track record on uh, Mother's Day. Uh, one year I preached on hell on Mother's Day. So I, I avoid it. So if you're sitting here saying, well, why was this a Mother's Day? So it's not. <laughs> uh, but what it is, uh, this is just an opportunity to begin here uh, a, a, a new book here that we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks uh, here, the first letter of John. And the first John is concerned with a really common question at its heart. And that question is, how do I know that God loves me? How do I know that I am saved? Right? How can I be sure that I have been reconciled to God and that when I stand in judgment before him, that I'll be shuttled off to the right with the sheep and not off to the left with the goats? I don't know whether that's his left or my left, but you get the point. Um, how do I know? People ask all the time, how do I know if I've done enough? And of course, the answer is, well, you've never done enough. But even if, even if I agree that salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, and not by works, and that there's nothing I can do myself to earn God's forgiveness and the promise of eternal life, how can I tell if I truly believe or if I'm just deluding myself? Now, you may be sitting here saying, I've never doubted that. I don't believe you. I'll be square. I have. <laughs> um, I think everyone does. Sometimes uh, we're told that we can't know. Some people will tell you, well, you can't know with any certainty until your death or until the return of Jesus, whichever happens first. And I mean, I guess there's, there's something to that in that I don't have some kind of magical CAT scan machine to scan you for true saving faith. But on another level, that's also profoundly mistaken. See, when you read the New Testament, the scriptures intend that believers in Jesus should be confident in their salvation. Scripture intends that you should know, in spite of yourself, that you should know yourself to be a true citizen of the kingdom of God. And that's actually, the, like I said, this is the theme, as much as anything else, of the first letter of John here. That's not just my opinion. He says so. Chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know it, not hope it, that you may know it. Now, it's true. The argument that he uses to get there, and if you sit down and read 1 John here this week, it's not that long. Um, the argument that he uses to get there is not quite as straightforward and systematic as you get in, say, Paul's letter to the Romans. But it's a little loopy. And, um, but over and over again, John returns to this question of how do we know that we are in Christ? How do we know that we are his? And he gives some answers. And we'll talk about those in time. We'll talk about those in fact. Right now, I just wanted to, look, to show you here a couple of things in the first four verses that are Im important to us. And right here in these four, first four verses, what he's really doing is he's, he's laying out for us why we should listen to him. Who is this guy writing this letter? 
that I should listen to him and, and take seriously what he has to say about Jesus. And when you look at this letter, the first thing you might notice, if you're for the Bible scholars out there, you might notice that there's no, unlike most of Paul's letters, for example, there's no address. Compare the, the first verse of, I'll oh, pick Philippians, right? First verse of Philippians begins, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ who are at Philippi. So there you have your, who's writing the letter, who's sending it, and where's it going? You get none of that in 1 John. This is one of what is ordinarily called the Catholic epistles, not because it's Roman, but because uh, it is written to the church Catholic, small c, universal. It's not aimed at a particular church somewhere. Um, and again, you notice that the, the author just dives in. He doesn't even give his own name. So if his name is nowhere, his name is nowhere in the letter. Whole thing. Not only is his name nowhere in 1 John, his name is nowhere in 2 John, his name is nowhere in 3 John, and Biblically, 3 John is just a paragraph. And oh, by the way, his name is nowhere in the Gospel of John. So why is this called 1 John and not something else? Um, I'm not going to go into the details here. Suffice it to say that the style and the content and the vocabulary, and the concepts, everything in 1 John here, if you pay attention to it, it's, and 2 John and 3 John, it is, I would argue here, obviously written either by the same person who wrote the Gospel of John, or written by someone who was doing a really good job of pretending to be the person who wrote the Gospel of John. And why would we say this is John? Um, well, <laughs> if you go to the Gospel of John, the author of the Gospel of John identifies himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and throughout the Gospel, this disciple whom Jesus loved does all of the same things in the Gospel of John that John, the son of Zebedee, brother of James, fisherman, does in the other three Gospels. So it's a pretty, I trust, just trust me on this, it's a pretty open and shut case. I got off on a rabbit trail this last week and spent an entire afternoon reading about author, authorship and dating theories on the Johannine epistles, and I could stand here for about an hour and a half and talk about it if you really want. Everybody shakes their head all at once, awesome. <laughs> <coughs> that saves me some work. <laughs> um, there's also external uh, an external tradition here. So I make this as simple as possible. So in the second century, there's this guy named Irenaeus, and he's a theologian. And Irenaeus wrote that he was uh, a student of a guy named Polycarp, who was a student of John the Apostle, son of Zebedee. And Irenaeus says that Polycarp told him that John told him that he had written the gospel and the letters. And um, if you want to, this has been, that, that, that is just an external tradition, but it's been the position of the church for 1900 years. And if you want to argue with it, fine, but you better have some evidence. And anyway, um, why should we be surprised? The guy who didn't sign his gospel or his other letters, by the way, in 2nd and 3rd John, he just introduces himself as the elder. Why would we, we be surprised that he doesn't sign this first letter, especially if everybody knew who it was from? And I think it's intentional. He doesn't sign it because this letter is not about John. It's about Jesus. And he wants to make that point from the very beginning. That's not to say that John himself is unimportant here. Um, in verse 1, he identifies his subject. He says that he's going to tell them about that which was from the beginning. Not as some abstract philosophy. Not as the accumulated wisdom of the ages. But as that which he says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands. This is really important for us. 
because um, we're entrusted with the gospel message just like John was, right? And the gospel message, ultimately, it's not about you. I hate to break that to you. If you happen to be a raging narcissist, I don't know. It's not about you. It's about the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that you're unimportant. You are important because you are the witness to that grace, just as John was here. You are the one who has heard and who has seen and who has touched, right? And by the way, John means this very, very literally, right? The one who's writing to you, he's insisting here, is one who heard the gospel message with his own ears from the lips of Jesus. He saw, with his, he says, with his own eyes, his emphasis, not mine, with his own eyes. What I think he means by that is this was not a vision. This is not some mystical vision he had, right? He wants you to understand that he saw Jesus. He watched as Jesus healed the sick, as he gave sight to the blind, as he walked on water, as he raised the dead, right? John was there. He was the only one of the twelve. The only one of the twelve who was there when Jesus was nailed to the cross. John 19, verse 26. He was there. He saw Jesus die with his own eyes. And this John who is writing to us, three days later, together with Peter, was the first to respond to the news brought to them by the women who had gone to the tomb on Sunday morning that the tomb was empty, that the stone was rolled away, that Jesus was not there. When he says, that which we have touched with our hands, I mean, on the one hand, yeah, I think he's talking about Jesus himself. Look, if you read uh, John 13, verse 25, you find that John sat next to Jesus at the Last Supper. If you want to witness, that's pretty good. He leaned on Jesus at the Last Supper. Or it could refer to the, the moment when he stepped into the empty tomb, John 20, verse 8, and he looked at and then presumably maybe handled the empty grave clothes that lay there where Jesus had been. Or that evening, it could refer to Jesus' invitation to, to see and, and possibly, as with Thomas's a week later, to touch his hands and his side, to see that this was not a ghost, but this is Jesus raised in flesh and blood and bone. The, the point is this, that the God, to whom, the God to whom John is bearing witness here, the God he wants to share with you is not a generic God. By the way, this is worth saying, because you live in a society that... Uh, that believes in a generic God. There's no such thing as a generic God. There just isn't. There's no such thing as generic religion. I ran into a guy a few weeks ago uh, who is a, uh, he said, said, oh, you're a pastor, that's great. He said, "I, I, I I majored in religion. And I'm a jerk. So I said, which one? And he said, no, 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 comparative religion. All of them. I, said, I was having a hard time holding. I, I probably should be nicer about this. I know there is such a discipline. As, but it still strikes me as profoundly wrong-headed. There's no such thing as generic religion. There's no such thing as a generic God. John is insisting here that he's not just another philosopher telling you how to reach some philosopher's God, some, some abstract superior being. He's telling you about Jesus. Someone he saw and touched and heard. This is, uh, this is something, look, the un- unbelieving world does not understand this. This is a scandal. This was a scandal 2,000 years ago. This is a scandal of the gospel today. Again, we live in a world that they're fine with the idea of a, a generic God. The world's okay with a generic God because a generic God will never ask you to do anything. A a generic God will never confront you 
with your sins. A generic God will never make any demands on you. A generic God can just be, oh yes, a nice idea. But what we find in the New Testament is not a generic God. Again, it's the Word made flesh in Jesus Christ. And this sounds ridiculous. If somebody hasn't said this to you, somebody will. They say, wait a minute. Are you telling me that a Jewish carpenter who lived on the other side of the world 2,000 years ago is God? And my answer is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that is pretty much the message. And it's scandalous to the world. It's scandalous to the world. But, as with the crucifixion, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, to those who are being saved, this miracle of the incarnation, God become flesh, not generic flesh, but specifically Jesus Christ. That's the glory of God and the power of God. At the end of verse 1 into verse 2 here, John um, says that he, he wants to tell them about the, the word of life. And again, this isn't a message, it's a person. It's a person. He says in verse 3 that this eternal life was with the Father and was made manifest to us. And if you don't already hear the echo, just compare that to the first verse of John's Gospel. It begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It goes on in verse 14 to say the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ. Um, this also is important to us. This isn't just John's credentials here, because it's a reminder that what we are sharing, the message that we have been given, and you've been given a message, the message that you've been given to live out in front of the world and to carry to the world is not a set of propositions. What do I mean by that? I mean, your job is not to go out and to tell the world a checklist that the world should, should check and believe. So, and that's not to say that there aren't propositions propositional truths in the gospel. There are. There are. I mean, you know, in order to understand who Jesus is, you've got to know that, hey, God created all things. That he created us to live with him in fellowship and in love. That in sin, that, that fellowship and love was broken and that by his grace, he reached out to us anyway. You know, you can go through all this, but ultimately, look, that's not what we're, we're not trying to get people to believe a checklist. We're trying to show people Jesus. I know that sounds sort of silly and simple, but that's it. Our message is not a set of propositional truths. Our message is a person, Jesus Christ. And the more we can show people Jesus, the better they will understand, and, and the more faithfully we will have done our job. Uh, finally here, at the end of verse 3 and 4, uh, John offers us, a, he gives us his motivation for writing. He tells us his motivation for writing. He says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. Why? So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I think when you read that at first, that seems a little backward. You know, wait a minute. Uh, if, if I asked you, most of you, hey, why should you share Jesus with others? You're going to say something about, well, so they could know God, so they could receive eternal life. But that's not what John says here. He says he's sharing this message so that... <laughs> You may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, um, oh, excuse me, that's later. Uh, he says that so that you too may have fellowship with us. And this, this again, this strikes us as a little backwards, but that's because we're 21st century Americans. We're raging individualists. We think of ourselves as little islands. And unfortunately, that taints our, our, our understanding of the gospel because we understand we, we tend to imagine the gospel message as aimed at individuals individually. In other words, that the gospel is about how you, as an individual, are reconciled to God. And that's true. It is about how you, as an individual, are reconciled to God, but you're not reconciled to God alone. Jesus did not die 
for a scattered herd of autonomous individuals. Jesus died for his church. For a covenant community. For what in 1 Peter chapter 2 is called a holy nation, a people for himself. To have fellowship with God in Christ is to have fellowship with other Christians. Doesn't work any other way. We're saved personally, but we're never saved alone. And there's a, um, a last motivation here at the end of verse, in verse 4. He says, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I should tell you here that there's a minor manuscript um, variation on that one. And when I say that, I mean that in certain copies, uh, manuscript copies, meaning written by hand, of 1 John, that word is changed. In certain copies, it says, so that your joy may be complete. But the oldest and the best manuscripts say our joy. And that's important because to bear witness to Jesus in word and in deed is a joyful thing. This is not some grueling duty that we have to do. We hope that it makes other people happy. But me, I'm miserable. No, this is for our joy. Our joy is complete in bearing witness to the love of God for his people.